Information, news, and entertainment on demand. WSRadio.com Welcome to This Week in Marketing, brought to you by the San Diego chapter of the American Marketing Association. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of This Week in Marketing. This is your host, Bill Wynn, with AMA San Diego. This is our first show following our biggest uh, event of the year, the Art of Marketing Conference, uh, which took place uh, in the last couple of weeks in Mission Valley. Uh, It was a fantastic event where we got together 200-plus San Diego area marketers. And and anytime you do that, um, you, you know, you give people a chance to kind of compare notes and and um, huddle over best practices and and all that kind of thing. And it was a fantastic confab that lasted the whole day, and we had some great some great speakers. So I hope you'll I hope you'll join us uh, next year uh, for that event, which, by the way, I will be chairing. So I will be looking for volunteers and sponsors and speakers and all that sort of thing, and we'll we'll begin uh, that effort here very shortly. Um, today we're going to be talking about the psychology of branding, and joining me today um, is a fellow who has spent a lot of time on this topic, both academically and also um, empirically. Um, his name is Brian Lisher. He runs a branding agency called Ignite. Um, good morning, Brian. How are you doing, Bill? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining me. Um, so, so let's talk about Ignite first and, and give us a little background on, on your agency. What, do you, what is it that you guys do? Yeah, so we're a boutique branding agency and we specialize in brand strategy, identity, and storytelling. And we help companies figure out who they are, what makes them unique, what they stand for. And uh, it's really a process of self-discovery to start, mm-hmm. uh, research and strategy, and then helping them create a new visual identity and uh, tell those stories, coming up with the different types of marketing collateral and different types of campaigns. So it's a really comprehensive, ongoing process. And um, what types of firms are these that you, you work with? Are they established brands? Are they startups? Where, where in the life cycle are they? Yeah, so we mostly work with small and medium-sized businesses. Um, sometimes we work with startups. It's a little bit more challenging to work with startups for a couple reasons. One is that they typically don't have the budgets to work with an agency like ours, or if they do, they don't have the timeline. They need stuff turned around quickly. They don't have six months to define a brand, Mm -hmm. and rightfully so. And they're typically changing so frequently their direction that it's, uh, it's it's not necessarily worth the investment to really define a solid brand framework at the time, but maybe focus more on a minimum viable brand and just identifying some of those core components to work on. And then we also work with large enterprises and we've worked with a few public companies, but it's, it's a little more challenging working with companies that large. And it's something that we aren't as interested in at this time. And we really like focusing more on that medium sized client is ideal for us because they've been around for a while. So there's a lot that we could dig into and they have uh, budgets that are, um, capable of doing really great work, but they aren't so big that they um, you can't actually change the company. Sometimes you work with companies that are so big you do this great work, but it's it's just too challenging or costly for them to implement it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I can see that. So, what is your what is your background? How did you how did you get into this this field? That's a great question. So. I think it really started in college. I studied psychology and communication at UC San Diego. And at the time, I thought I wanted to become either a therapist or some sort of research psychologist. And a couple of years into that, I realized I was just more curious about learning more about myself and those around me, more specifically how we think and how we create meaning. So naturally, that led me into the fields of uh, marketing and design. And I spent uh, over a decade working uh, both client and agency side, really got in on the ground floor of the digital marketing revolution in the early 2000s. So doing uh, search engine optimization and uh, you know, designing banner ads and all these new exciting things. Mm-hmm. So spent about 12 years doing that and then left that world and went and started Ignite. 
So what, what's interesting to me about that is I did the opposite thing. I was in more communications and then decided I really wanted to be in, in digital, right? Because I felt that that was more, uh, more uh, stickier, frankly, right, for, for brands to, that, were, that were dependent on the internet for, for revenue, so to speak. Um, so what is it about psychology specifically that is so relevant to branding? I think to answer that, you first have to define what a brand is. So that's something that I'd like the audience, I'd encourage everyone in the audience to take a moment to uh, think about that question for yourself. What is a brand? And Bill, maybe we'll even start with you. How would you define a brand? Well, I, that's cheating, right? Because you and I have, have prepped for this show. So I know that, that you're, in your parlance, a brand is not just, just a physical thing, right? It's a far more ephemer- ephemeral thing. And it ties actually a lot to to customer experience, right? Because it's all these things that you that you feel about a brand and that you hear about a brand that aren't necessarily directly attributable to the brand, right? But it's it's kind of all those things put together um, that represent the, an idea more so than a physical thing. Yeah, that's great. You know, I ask this question a lot, and more. Often, I'm starting to hear responses like that. A couple years ago, I think people are starting to tune in and uh, become a lot more aware of what a brand really is. So a couple years ago, I'd ask that question, and I'd hear a lot of people say it's it's a logo, like um, the famous Nike swoosh, or it's a company name like Apple. And the challenge is, is that brands aren't something that you could point to, like a name or a logo. And that's because they live in the mind and they live in the minds of your employees, your customers, your investors, and really everyone else that they come into contact with. So simply put, brands are perceptions. And perception, it's a powerful thing. And that's because the way people perceive your brand ultimately influences the way that they engage with your brand. And the level to which that they engage with your brand or that they don't engage with your brand ultimately impacts your bottom line. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really important to understand that brands don't live in the material world like a company, but that they live in the mind. It's the way that people experience your product, your service, your company, and then um, and then it's just this also understanding that perception is reality, and it's just a way that our brains have been wired that we can't tell the difference between what we perceive and what is real. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really important understanding from a psychological level because then that leads into branding. And branding is the practice of shaping perceptions or we talk about architecting reality because you can actually, through design and messaging and then the marketing execution or the advertising execution, you could literally shape the way that people perceive your company. There is no objective reality. Everything that we see, hear, and feel, it's just really electrical signals being interpreted by our brains. So there is no objective reality out there. And it's getting a little philosophical, but it's it's just it's it's how the world is and it's how we are wired as human beings. So if you could understand that, then you can learn how to shape the way that people perceive your company. Mm-hmm. And so um so let's 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 restate that right. Your your definition, which I think is a good one, is is there's a clear difference between branding and marketing. One of those is um, is being, and the other is doing. Right. Yeah, that's correct. It's a it's another question that I get a lot is what is the difference between branding and marketing? And since we do both, it's it's easy for us to see the difference and also where they overlap. And yeah, branding is more about the being. It's about defining who you are as a company or who your product is, what you're about. What is your purpose? Why do you exist beyond making money? What is your vision? What is your mission? You know, what is your visual identity? What is your tone of voice? These are all very strategic things that you do once, or maybe you need to revisit it five or 10 years later, but you go through the process of branding or rebranding to define these things. And then marketing is taking that positioning, understanding who your audience is. So we do a lot of customer research. We're defining buyer personas. And once you understand who your company is and who your audience is, then the marketing is the, uh, the strategy and tactics that connect those two. 
So marketing is ongoing activity where this uh, foundational branding is, is something that you do once and then you're going to come back and revisit it and optimize it. But it's not like you're going through these campaigns every 30 days and changing who you are. Mm-hmm. Now, you said um, quickly that 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 branding is also the shaping of perceptions, right? So, so another word for shaping of perceptions might be uh, manipulation, right, or coercion. So, what? So, talk for a second about kind of the 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 ethics of of branding, right, and how and how that works. Yes, in your mind. Yes, as effective marketers and branding professionals, we have a responsibility to make sure that the way that we are executing these types of campaigns are ethical and ethics is it's something that is uh, subjective. It's, it's something that every individual or every company needs to define for themselves. You know, where do we draw the line? But it's just this idea that you could see elections, you know, everything that happened with Facebook, that it's elections are being thrown because of marketing and these fake news and just these ideas that are getting into people's heads. So it's so powerful that it can even throw an election. It could shape the way people uh, purchase a product. So there's a lot of... I'm going to stop you there because we're coming up on a break. So when we come back from the break, we'll, we'll pick up where we left off here on the ethics of branding. podcast or radio show on WS Radio is a great way to create content marketing. Turn prospects into customers into raving fans. Contact Wade at wsradio.com or call 866-WS-RADIO. Hi, this is Rob Barnett, CM founder of VinVillage.com and the Wine and Dine show on VinVillage Radio. Do you have a wine, event, product, or service to promote? Then contact VinVillage.com to reach thousands of wine lovers across the country. VinVillage connects like-minded wine enthusiasts with unique and exclusive wines, events, products, and services. To learn more, contact us on VinVillage.com. VinVillage is where wine lovers connect. I raised $8,000 to build schools for South African children. After realizing how many people go hungry in San Diego, I now volunteer at a food pantry. I'm spending the next year doing volunteer projects across three countries and helping in ways they designate to be the most helpful. The World Link program at the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice recognizes the potential of youth as agents of social change. Learn how you can help youth become a generation of leaders in action at peace.sandiego.edu. One person has the power to change the world, impact millions of lives, and leave a legacy for lifetimes to come. That person is you. In the New York Times bestseller, What is Your What? Steve Ulcher, award-winning author and founder of the Reinvention Workshop, reveals his proven process that has helped thousands of men and women discover, share, and monetize the one thing they were born to do. Grab your free copy now at www.whatisyourwhat.com slash free. That's www.whatisyourwhat.com forward slash free. Take a break from politics. Tune in and learn something. WS Radio shows are worth your time and are filled with tips and advice. Add us to your lunch routine and we'll give you a meal for your mind. You take your smartphone almost everywhere you go. Now WSRadio.com can be there too. Search WS Radio in the Play Store for your Android devices or iTunes for Apple and download the WS Radio application. WSRadio.com on your phone and in your ear everywhere you go. Download the WS Radio application. Do it now. It's very easy. WSRadio.com. 
Small businesses are the lifeblood of America's economy. Every Thursday, SBA Radio interviews industry professionals and is dedicated to provide small businesses with timely insights and innovations. Visit www.sbaradio.us for details. Talk to me. Information, news, and entertainment on demand. WSRadio.com. Welcome to This Week in Marketing. Brought to you by the San Diego chapter of the American Marketing Association. Welcome back. This is your host, Bill Wynn, with AMA San Diego. We're chatting with Brian Lisher today um, from Ignite about the psychology of branding. So, Brian, when we left off, we were talking about uh, the the ethics of branding and marketers' um, power to be, um, how, how should we say it, unethical, with that, with the power to manipulate opinion and manipulate perception. So, so what is what is marketers' responsibility or branding experts' responsibility to speak truthfully about about brands? Sure. So there's there's really a couple sides to that. So there's certain industries that are highly regulated, healthcare, financial services. Those are industries that either people's lives are at risk or their financial. Um, you know, futures are at risk. There's so many thousands, millions of people that have been taken advantage of from a financial perspective because of marketing and just getting them into some sort of, uh, you know, really bad situation. And same with healthcare. It's it's there's there's a lot of laws in place that protect the the you know the patients' rights. And um, there's uh it's industries like that 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 have been abused by marketing that already have very strict guidelines. So it's not even a, just a matter of ethics at that point. It's, it's you know, staying out of trouble. And then there's other industries or just marketing in general that it becomes more relative where you just, as a marketer, as a company, you have to define how far are we willing to go to get people to purchase our product. And um, it's about really... From my perspective, it's about checking in with yourselves, making sure that you're, one, being authentic, that you're representing your products or services in a way that is true to yourself. So everyone could be a little bit aspirational when they're trying to sell a product or service, but don't go so far that you're making false claims. And also, market in a way that is authentic to you. Don't just start copying other people because you think it's uh, you know clever or it's some sort of trendy way of doing marketing. So that's another side of it too. It's it's really just being honest with yourself and it's like it's clear about what's right and wrong. If if you if you can't tell that there's something else going on that you might want to take a look into. Yeah, so. and, and we talk a lot, I mean obviously on this show, but marketing in general about the importance of transparency and authenticity to today's consumers and people have more ways than ever to figure out what you're really about, right? So, so it's not just the right thing to do, but but being honest um, is, is a requirement based on what will eventually happen if you're not. Yeah. Seems like. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and there was a uh, you know this just came to mind for some reason, but there's this music festival called the Fire Festival that was oh, promoted. Yeah. yeah. I mean that's a that's a perfect case. I've seen the videos in hindsight. Um, you know, I didn't find out about it happening until it was happening, but. Um, I've gone back and I've looked at the videos and it's it's just the stories that they're telling through imagery and hiring influencers and models and, and their marketing efforts. It's getting people to uh, not just go to a you know, remote island to some sort of music festival, but also paying very premium prices only to get there and have the exact opposite. And so that's a classic example of where you know, those people just didn't have ethics and they took it too far. Yeah. And it's not just uh, saying that our product is, again, there's, you could be a little aspirational in your services and, and products as far as, as what they do, as long as you're going to deliver, but don't go so far that people show up to your resort and there isn't even a resort there. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the process that you go through um, in terms of a, a, a branding effort or a rebranding effort and, and to what degree you incorporate psychology into that process. Yeah, great. So psychology is really incorporated throughout both on the more of the analytical side, which is research and strategy, and then the creative side, which is more of that 
creative execution, the storytelling, and design and messaging. So we start off every rebranding project with in-depth brand research. And there's a few different types of research that we do. We actually have a PhD sociologist on our team that heads up our research team. So we're doing very uh, academic grade research and we do internal brand research. That's something that a lot of companies don't think about. That's actually where we start is by understanding the uh, culture of a company and we ask questions. We do one-on-one interviews. And if the company's big enough, if let's say they have over uh, maybe 500 or 1,000 employees, we will even do a company-wide survey. And we're trying to understand not only the culture, but how do the people within your company perceive being in that company? And what do they think are the company's value propositions or unique differentiators? How do they talk to your customers, and how do they think your customers perceive you? So we start inside out. And then once we get that understanding, then we go and do customer research or external stakeholder research. So it's not just your customers, but also strategic partners and the community sometimes. And it's about understanding current brand perceptions. That's really what research is all about, because you can't plan for the future until you understand today. And so you have to start with that objective um, understanding of of how people are currently experiencing your brand, its strengths, its weaknesses, and all the areas for opportunity. Of course, in relationship to how they're perceiving your competition. And then we also do a, a competitive brand audit where we audit your internal brand and your top five to 10 competitors, where we're Uh, examining the visual and verbal language of your brand. So this is where one of our designers and our copywriters gets involved and they're analyzing your color palette and your logo and your photography and those of your competition. And then our copywriter gets involved and looks at your brand messaging, your tone of voice, language style, things like that. And again, just identifying what's currently working with your brand and more importantly, what's not working with your brand and then looking at the competitive landscape and looking for opportunities to differentiate. In, in the times that you've gone through this process, um, have, you, have you produced an assessment or an analysis of, of the results that's been a real, a, a real surprise to company management, right? That, that the internal stakeholders see the company really differently than, than management thinks that their that their brand is 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 representing. There's never been a drastic surprise, and so I actually get this question a lot during the sales process from companies: is what should we expect? And I think this is this is relative what I'm about to say, but 80 percent of what we return as far as the insights should be aligned with what you already know, and they're just reinforcing what you already know are your strengths and weaknesses. And it's important to validate those. And then the other 20%, give or take, should be new insights. And half of those are negative. They're areas that need to be improved. I had no idea that customers perceived this part of the onboarding process a certain way. Let's go fix that. And the other part is um, strengths that you were unaware of, too. So that always comes out as well. I had no idea that our customers valued that we did that in the onboarding process. So things like that. And that's typically how the research plays out is there's a handful of things that need to be addressed from a negative perspective and then there's a handful of things that um, you know, really need to be doubled down on. But we could distill all those insights into uh, a list of value propositions, differentiators, and then it just it gives us stuff that has now been validated and has statistical significance and um, it's, it's all about se- segmentation, too, and what types of customers you're talking to. So we want to talk with your best customers, the types of customers that you want more of. That's where we focus most of our effort, understanding who these people are and how they currently experience your brand so that we could attract more of them. But we also want to talk to a handful of customers that you've lost and uh, that you still have a relationship with. Maybe you have j- they just uh, outgrew your brand or you outgrew their needs. 
So, um, it, it sounds like like there's some fantastic insights that you can get from from soliciting feedback, both internally and externally, that you would benefit from whether or not you're going through a rebrand process, right? Absolutely. And the insights you get out of there, it, they're not just for branding and marketing. Mm-hmm. You're going to get, um, you know, both opportunities, um, positive and, and, and negative feedback on things that impact hiring, operations, um, you know, product development. Uh, we did, we worked with a B2B healthcare company and one of their customers, or actually multiple customers of theirs, were talking about these random insights so that they're in the um, like revenue cycle management business and they've done millions and millions of transactions from hospitals and healthcare providers that they have all this data over a couple decades and they would randomly send out to their customers these insight reports on trends and they didn't think much about it and their customers said we, we want more of those and, and one of them went so far to say they should create a conference around this no one else in the industry is doing it and those are just these light bulb moments sure and that influenced the whole positioning and the messaging and the way that we executed the identity and then now they're working on developing these into quarterly reports and so all sorts of great things come out of that type of research great Okay, when we return from the next break, we'll continue to talk about psychology of branding with Brian Lisher of Ignite. You're listening to This Week in Marketing with AMA San Diego on WSRadio.com, the worldwide leader in Internet talk. Securing our eCity Foundation is a nonprofit organization focused on cybersecurity awareness and education. Formed in 2011, their mission is to enable every San Diegan to live, work, and play safely in the cyber world. For more information, visit securingourecity.org or call 619-630-2444. securingourecity.org, 619-630-2444. securingourecity.org. Tired of presentations with no impact, no inspiration, and no traction? Do dull speakers have you and your team disengaged and distracted by smartphones? Christopher McAuliffe brings energy, insights, and two decades of experience delivered with punch, humor, and heart. Your team will leave energized, uplifted, and with a sense of purpose. Visit ChristopherMcAuliffe.com to bring some heat to your next speaking engagement. M-C-A-U-L-I-F-F-E. ChristopherMcAuliffe.com. Take a break from politics. Tune in and learn something. WS Radio shows are worth your time and are filled with tips and advice. Add us to your lunch routine and we'll give you a meal for your mind. Kenja Dixon was crowned the number one sales executive through hard work, deep thinking, and the revelation of universal talk laws. He now wants to share these lessons with you. Universal talk laws are what you need to know and use in business and at home to have successful and effective conversations. Kenja Dixon shares his wisdom, action plans, and wealth. Each book comes with a chance to win $10,000. Find universal talk laws at KenjaDixon.com. Do you want to be a professional coach? Are you in business trying to make a real difference with people you manage or work with? Have you started a coaching practice that isn't quite getting off the ground? Get the skills you need to be a successful coach today with the Coach's Training Program from Accomplishment Coaching. The Coach's Training Program will show you how to help others focus and be more fulfilled. Whether you want to improve your company's bottom line or create a thriving coaching practice, Accomplishment Coaching can give you the distinctions and practices you need to coach others effectively today. Accomplishment Coaching has spent six years developing a cutting-edge coaches training program that will have you ready to coach people professionally in just 12 months, and you don't have to take time off work to do it. To find out more about the coaches training program, just call 1-888-548-6813. That's 1-888-548-6813. 
Small businesses are the lifeblood of America's economy. Every Thursday, SBA Radio interviews industry professionals and is dedicated to provide small businesses with timely insights and innovations. Visit www.sbaradio.us for details. Talk to me. Information, news, and entertainment on demand. WSRadio.com. Welcome to This Week in Marketing. Brought to you by the San Diego chapter of the American Marketing Association. We are resuming our discussion with Brian Lisher of Ignite around the psychology of branding. So, Brian, after you've gone through this research process, right, you've talked to internal stakeholders, you've talked to external stakeholders, you've gathered as much information as you can from your best customers, but also customers you've lost, maybe even prospective customers, right? You're trying to find out kind of what what makes everyone tick what is all this information in aid of what do you what do you do with it it's a great question so after we complete that research phase we present all the findings to the key project stakeholders we distill the research into buyer personas and then we move into the brand strategy and positioning phase and the way that we approach that is through these hands-on workshops that we call brand focus workshops. They typically take place in two half day workshops and the outcome is a brand brief and the brand brief includes all the foundational messaging for your brand. And what we're really defining here is a brand framework and a comprehensive brand framework. It has seven layers and at the core is your brand compass and that includes your purpose, vision, mission, and values. And so it's really critical that all companies define those. If, if you haven't defined one yet, that's definitely a good place to start because not only is that going to be a great compass for guiding the uh, direction of your brand, but it also impacts all other areas of your organization and your company culture. The next layer is uh, brand's positioning. So this includes differentiating statements like your value propositions and your brand promise and competitive advantage. And so those are other just really fundamental aspects that should be defined by every brand. And then once those have been defined, then you move on to the third layer, which is brand personality. And that's a set of human characteristics that are expressed by a brand. So it includes adjectives such as trustworthy, intelligent, or even fun. We recently worked with a brand out of New York where one of their, not only their personality traits, but one of their uh, core differentiators was fun. So that was literally a fun project to work on. And then after personality comes your brand's name, which should relate to your audience on a deep and personal level. So we do a lot of naming work. It's by far the most challenging aspect of the branding process because so much there's so much expectation, especially from our clients, around what a name uh, should evoke. And some, sometimes they get a little stuck on the name trying to mean everything. And the name, as important as it is, it's only one aspect of this uh, foundation, but it is important to get right because it lives everywhere, not just everywhere your logo is, but also in print, like in a press release, for example. And then after your name comes your brand's visual identity, which is its face to the world. And this includes your logo, your color palettes, your uh, typography. So the different types of fonts that you use, photography, and really all of the visual identity elements. And then Story, on the other hand, which is the next layer, is your brand's verbal language. And that's expressed by the voice and messaging that bring your brand to life. So those are are really, um, you know, and then the final layer is just brand touch points. So that's your marketing collateral, your website. But you need to define that, that brand foundation, starting with the brand compass, walking, you know, everything that I just walked you through. Um, and that's really strategy and positioning. Mm-hmm. And by going through that process and defining those things and, and maybe taking a look, depending on how complex your brand is. So we work with a lot of complex brands that have many different sub brands or product lines. Then you need to start taking a look at things like brand architecture as well and, and get organized. What type of brand architecture do you have? Is it um, is it a, a branded house, house like FedEx or is it a house of brands like Procter & Gamble, where each of the brands stands on its own, mm-hmm. or is it endorsed, or some sort of hybrid? 
Uh, that's really important to, if we're talking about architecting reality and the way that people perceive your brand, that brand architecture is that scaffolding that organizes all your different products and services and different entities into a logical order, both visually and also through uh, positioning and verbal language. I have to imagine that when you're a brand that that has offerings that apply to both wholesalers, for example, or or trades, right, or commercial customers versus direct to consumer, that those are that's that's a much more complicated undertaking than than just one or the other. It is, and we yeah. So we work with a lot of B two B companies. So we'll, you know, most of them are selling through a channel. And they aren't selling directly to, um, you know, the end business. Or, or even if they're a consumer-facing brand, they, they still have other businesses, other dealers, and uh, other types of stakeholders that are ultimately selling on their behalf. So they don't even have control of that final purchasing um, environment. And that becomes really challenging. It's even challenging to uh, oftentimes recruit research participants for these types of brands, because a lot of times our customers, they don't even have direct access to their end consumer, the mm-hmm. end user. So that becomes more challenging. And working with technology companies, or we also work with a lot of companies that are going through a lot of M&A activities or mer- mergers and acquisitions. And that just, again, it's they, they start acquiring a bunch of companies and they're, you know, they're trying their best, their internal marketing teams trying their best to figure out we just acquired this company. Should we uh, keep this as its own brand or should we take the name and slap our logo next to it? Or mm-hmm. what do we do with this? And they might be able to solve that problem once or twice, but then they start growing more and more and more. And that's really when they need an outside expert to come in yep. and do the research and, and help them through that brand architecture uh, process, which, yeah. which again, really needs to be – brand architecture is really complicated. There's a lot of things to consider when you're uh, defining your brand architecture. Mm -hmm. So a a, a related word, um, a related word is um, brand archetypes, right? So, you you know, you talked a a little while ago about brands being um, fun or playful uh, or, or something else, right? So, so what are kind of the give, let's give some examples of archetypes and Mm -hmm. brands that people know um, so they can think, think about uh, that topic. Great. Yeah. Brand archetypes and brand archetypes, They've been around, archetypes in general have been around for a very long time. It, it, Plato was one of the first people that started talking about elementary forms. And after him, um, Carl Jung and Freud and then Joseph Campbell. These are all very influential people that have spent um, you know, most of their life studying things like mythology and religion and culture and doing that comparative analysis and have basically been able to determine that there's these universal stories, these imprints um, in our mind or our, our consciousness that, um, you know, that really just are this, this fundamental way that we understand the world around us. So some examples of archetypes, a classic one is the hero, the hero archetype and a brand that has, embodied that for most of its lifespan has been Nike. So Nike is actually the wing goddess of victory. So Nike wasn't their original name. They, they had some other name before it. I forget what it is. It, it's something, um, you know, multiple words. And they changed it to Nike, which happens to be the wing goddess of victory. And so that's all about victory. It's about heroic activities uh, the Nike swoosh, it, it is actually shaped like a wing, um, you know, tying back to, um, again, you know, victory. And so they built this entire brand starting with their name and then their identity. And then, of course, all the storytelling they've done over the decades that are that's just all about being a hero. And another one could be the sage. So. Brands like Harvard, for example, represent the sage. They're these holders of knowledge. Like You would go to Harvard because there's a certain type of expectation that you're going to have around what type of uh, value you're going to get out of it. You're going to be sm- smarter and scholarly. There's just so much um, you know, legacy that's tied into those types of archetypes there. The, um, the Guardian 
um, is like the Coast Guard, for example, uh, Virgin Airlines or Harley Davidson, the outlaw archetype. So each of these brands represents this type of personality that is expressed through all their messaging, their positioning, their storytelling, and it allows people to connect with them. If you want to purchase a Harley, that's you start using brands as this uh, vehicle to express your own self-identity. When you buy a pair of Nike shoes, you're saying something to the world. Whether you're a good athlete or not, like when you're you know, lacing up those Nike shoes, you, you start thinking of these images in your head, whether you're consciously aware of them or not, mm-hmm. about just conquering some race. I mean, you might be 50 pounds overweight, but you're still feeling that when you're lacing up the Nike shoes. And the same reason when you purchase a Harley and you're riding around the neighborhood, you know, you just, you're, you're expressing that outlaw um, part of your identity that you might not be able to express at the office every mm-hmm. day. You know, and you said, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie back two things we just talked about. So one was you talked about the challenge of going through the merger and acquisition process. You also just managed, uh, you also just mentioned Virgin, right? And their, their archetype is, is a bit of an outlaw, a bit of a, um, a disruptor. Meanwhile, uh, Virgin is merging with, with Alaska Airlines, which is a, a totally different kind of brand, right? So those mergers have got to be hugely challenging when you're tying those two different archetypes together. It is, absolutely, especially when the brands are so just so different. Yeah. So that's going to be a challenge for them. Yeah. All right, well, let's stop there. Um, we'll return for our final segment here in uh, just a couple of minutes. You're listening to This Week in Marketing with AMA San Diego on WSRadio.com, the worldwide leader in Internet talk. Take your smartphone almost everywhere you go. Now WSRadio.com can be there, too. Search WS Radio in the Play Store for your Android devices or iTunes for Apple and download the WS Radio application. WSRadio.com, on your phone and in your ear everywhere you go. Download the WS Radio application. Do it now. It's very easy. WSRadio.com. On the Internet, your business's reputation can be unjustly destroyed in an instant. Don't wait for that to happen. Building and marketing your five-star reputation can increase your business by as much as 19%. Take control of your reputation and have the five-star reputation you deserve with Reputation Marketing Solutions by DSI Development. Become the go-to company by visiting 5starrepmarketing.com. The number 5, starrepmarketing.com. Nowadays, Internet devices are an integral part of your home. Everyone in your family has a smartphone, tablet, or a computer. Life is easier knowing that all your devices are secured and your family can surf the Internet carefree. ESET Multi-Device Security Pack does just that. One license for all your devices. With ESET, it's simple to stay protected and save money. Enjoy safer technology with ESET Multi-Device Security Pack at ESET.com. That's E-S-E-T dot com. You may have heard me brag about Progressive Medical Center and just how much they've helped me with my health. And Dr. Goley, one thing that you've helped so many people with is migraines. Unfortunately, there are millions and millions of Americans who are suffering with migraines and headaches, and they're debilitating because it affects the quality of their life, and they cannot function properly. At Progressive, we get the root cause because we understand that migraines could be caused by nutritional deficiencies, hormonal imbalances, believe it or not, delayed food sensitivities. And once we determine what the real reason is, we put a plan of action together with medication that we get them off slowly and we put them on an all-natural approach and the results are amazing. Incredible. I mean, there's so many people that can say they don't live their lives with migraines anymore thanks to Progressive Medical Center. And that's what's exciting and rewarding to us as physicians because we help our patients take control of their health and that's why they're living well. Why don't you get a hold of Progressive Medical Center today? Don't live in pain. Don't have migraines anymore. Just go to their website, progressivemedicalcenter.com. This is your life. Live it well. 
Did you know the majority of radio listeners are between the ages of 35 and 54, have a household income of more than $100,000, are classified as executives or professionals, and share the show they listen to? Become part of the Peggy Smedley Show to reach listeners looking for information on connected devices through cost-effective radio commercials or segment sponsorships. Contact us at 630-933-0844 for more information or visit PeggySmedleyShow.com. Talk to me. Information, news, and entertainment on demand. WSRadio.com. Welcome to This Week in Marketing, brought to you by the San Diego chapter of the American Marketing Association. We're back for our final segment with Brian Lisher of Ignite, and we're talking about the psychology of branding here this morning. So, uh, Brian, one of the interesting things we were just talking about uh, in the last segment was the message you're sending when you're tying on those Nike shoes or when you're, when you're riding that, that Harley-Davidson bike and how those brands connect with, with personalities, right? And so my question to you is, how how can how can branding create loyalty and you know the the example i think of is there are there are times when people stay loyal to the brand despite another solution maybe being technically better for them on paper it's very difficult to get people to to switch brands right so i mean you know coke and pepsi is kind of the classic right there was the you know the pepsi challenge back in the whatever that was 70s or 80s and even though people preferred the taste of Pepsi, getting them to switch long term was proved to be very difficult, right? So talk about loyalty and affinity and how psychology plays into those. It's a really fascinating topic. So as I was mentioning in the last segment, brands are a vehicle or some people call them a badge or a conduit for individuals to express their self-identity. And that's really important to understand their self-identity. So the more that your customer sees themselves in your brand or that they could use their brand to send that message to the world, whether it's wearing the Nike shoes or riding the Harley Davidson or driving the BMW, you know, BMW is all about performance. It's different than maybe luxury for Mercedes. You know, each of these brands has a different purpose for people's self-identity. The more that they see themselves in your brand, the more loyal they're going to be. The harder it is for them to be able to change because it's hard for people as individuals to change who they are. And um, so that's that, that's the way to do it is to really build like understanding who you are as a brand, who your audience is, and then continuing to reinforce that loop, that self-identity loop is going to lead to Uh, more loyalty. So for example, um, Apple, iPhones versus Androids. I'm a huge Apple fan. I could never imagine like using a PC. Like when I do use a PC, for example, it's, I I don't feel like myself. Like, and I couldn't imagine using an Android, even though Androids are probably like objectively better than iPhones at this point. But I just, I can't make the switch. Like Apple would have to get so bad before I switch because <laughs> like using a Mac is just, it's not, it's, it's who I am. And using a PC, it's, it's like this, it would just be like me dressing like way differently. It, it wouldn't feel right. It's literally it'd be like wearing an outfit that didn't like match who I was. So that's really powerful. And so I think that's, you know, that, that's the power of, of branding is being able to, like, I remember actually being a kid and, I must have been, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old, and I always wore Nikes. I just had an affinity t- towards them for whatever reason. And um, I remember one of my friends got a pair of Adidas, and I thought they were really cool. So I went out and, and tried them on at the store with my mom, and they just didn't feel right. Like this just, like I wanted, like, th- like this shoe is cooler looking, but it does not feel right. And I remember that feeling. I didn't know that what branding was at the time or what marketing was as just a kid in the nineties. But, uh, looking back in hindsight, I'm like, wow, that's probably my first, um, conscious memory of 
that brand affinity and mm-hmm. loyalty. Yeah. Now we, we hear these days the word tribe being used a lot. We hear it in politics. We you know we certainly hear it in um, in marketing and, and nonprofits and so forth. Um, talk about the importance of wanting to belong to something and and exclusivity as being part of branding. That's a pretty powerful driver for human behavior, right? It is, and it ties back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So, again, getting back into the scientific community and into psychology and sociology is love and belonging. It's the third level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So it is part of the human condition, um, unless you're a sociopath, that you want to belong. It's just how we're wired. It's why there were tribes tens of thousands of years ago and why there still are today. Now we aren't hanging out in a cave or in the jungle, but we're, you know, at... at some, some still are, some, but they're, some they're rarer are. and rarer. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're, we're hanging out in certain groups or organizations or going to certain restaurants or nightclubs, um, wearing certain types of shoes, going to, you know, uh, uh, sports teams. Uh, those are tribes. And one of the things that um, actually makes tribes so powerful is having all these barriers of entry to get in. So excluding people, you want your brand, tying that back to your brands, you want your product or service or your overall identity of your company, you want it to repel people just as much as you want it to attract. In some ways, you want it to repel more people than attract. I guess it depends on how many customers you need. But for our agency, I mean, if we get 12, you know, 10 to 20 new customers a year. I mean, we're doing great. And so we don't need to appeal to millions of people. We just need to appeal to 10 or 20 every year. So it's, I'm constantly disqualifying people. One, because they aren't a good fit, but it also, when you start to repel people and, and, and say, Hey, you, I don't think you're a good fit for us, for our company. Um, it actually makes them watch you even more usually. Yeah, and I've I've heard of companies using using that um, and, and just having it be a natural part of their sales process. Really, where you know the qualification is almost an achievement for that client, right? Like, okay, you've cleared all these you've cleared all these hurdles. We're welcoming you to our tribe, right? And it that's, is that can be a successful strategy. Yeah, and it's um, I think if you could get into a um, out of that scarcity mindset into abundance mindset as a as a marketer or as a business owner and realize that there are unlimited amount of customers out there for you and uh, start practicing disqualifying people more that you'd be surprised at the results and just trusting that and that's like going back to Coke and Pepsi it's there's I'm a Coke drinker I don't like Pepsi um, I haven't thought about that much taste brand. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know like how much you know subconsciously that's that's uh, you know imprinted on my um, mind. You know, since being a child. But it's like there's there's plenty of people that want to drink Coke, or there's plenty of people that want to drink Pepsi, or have an iPhone, or have an Android. There's there's plenty to go around for all these companies to be really successful. And it's just about knowing who your audience is. Um, you know, for us, like I know that like people that want to know the truth are a good fit for us. I've been able to get people to, you know, sign a contract who didn't want to know the truth, you know, many years ago and then regret it because then they come into our process and our process is all about finding the truth. And they're like, I'm not ready to know the truth. I don't want to interview my customers. I don't want to know what they think of us. And that's a horrible fit for us. Mm-hmm. So it's about understanding what that is for your company, and then just doubling down on on those that are the right fit, and then actually publicly repelling people, pushing away people that aren't, and that's going to really strengthen your tribe. You want that story to go around that your company is not the right fit for everyone. Yeah, and I guess that's something you can do both both very publicly, overtly, and 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 a little more quietly. Like a, there, it's both a marketing and a sales thing, right? So it it's, is. It's bothly. It's it's both. Um, a, a, communi- a, a mass market communication thing, but it can also be um, a sales process kind of individual one-on-one thing. Yeah. Right. So let's, um, let's leave it there, Brian. I appreciate you coming in today. Enjoyed the discussion. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's where, been fun. Yeah, where can people find out more about Ignite? Yeah, come to our website. We have it in the show notes. 
um, ignitebrands.com. That is I G N Y T E brands.com. And that's a good place to start. Or my Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter. Brian Lisher is uh, B R I A N L I S C H E R. Okay. Thanks again. We'll leave it there. You've been listening to This Week in Marketing with AMA San Diego on WSRadio.com. Securing our eCity Foundation is a nonprofit organization focused on cybersecurity awareness and education. Formed in 2011, their mission is to enable every San Diegan to live, work, and play safely in the cyber world. For more information, visit securingourecity.org or call 619 630 2444. securingourecity.org, 619 630 2444. securingourecity.org. Do you want to be a professional coach? Are you in business trying to make a real difference with people you manage or work with? Have you started a coaching practice that isn't quite getting off the ground? Get the skills you need to be a successful coach today with the Coach's Training Program from Accomplishment Coaching. The Coach's Training Program will show you how to help others focus and be more fulfilled. Whether you want to improve your company's bottom line or create a thriving coaching practice, Accomplishment Coaching can give you the distinctions and practices you need to coach others effectively today. Accomplishment Coaching has spent six years developing a cutting-edge coaches training program that will have you ready to coach people professionally in just 12 months, and you don't have to take time off work to do it. To find out more about the coaches training program, just call 1-888-548-6813. That's 1-888-548-6813. Tired of presentations with no impact, no inspiration, and no traction? Do dull speakers have you and your team disengaged and distracted by smartphones? Christopher McAuliffe brings energy, insights, and two decades of experience delivered with punch, humor, and heart. Your team will leave energized, uplifted, and with a sense of purpose. Visit ChristopherMcAuliffe.com to bring some heat to your next speaking engagement. M-C-A-U-L-I-F-F-E. ChristopherMcAuliffe.com. Looking to be a successful entrepreneur? The virtual assistant industry continues to be a top choice for those looking to start their own business. The problem can be how to become a virtual assistant. Many turn to the Bible of the VA industry, the book, Virtual Assistant, the series. And it's the perfect guide for office managers, executive assistants, and other administrative professionals looking to make the transition from employee to successful business owner. Go to vatheseries.com to get your copy today. Hi, Scale listener. This is David Finkel, co-host with Jeff Hoffman of Scale Your Business. I wanted to let you know that our newest book, Scale, was just released and to encourage you to get your copy. The book will give you seven proven principles to grow your business and get your life back. Scale will help you work less by getting your business to produce more. Get your copy online or at your local bookseller. For more information, visit us online at scaleyourbusinesstoolkit.com.